everybody. Uh, please welcome back writer, director, Enrico Casarosa. Oh, where is Enrico? Oh, oh my goodness, there you go. Coming this way. Welcome, um, everybody, and that was the voice, I mean, that Sasha Baron Cohen plays uh, Ugo. I don't know if you guys uh, knew that. That's right, yeah. And, and what, <laughs> what, first question, what was it like working with Sasha in this little cameo? It was so much fun. Uh, I mean, it really was like one and a half, uh, you know, times. We, we, he gave us a couple hours once and once, once more, it was a small part. It was one of the silver linings of having to work remotely. I don't think we probably would have been able to get his time. You normally have people come to Pixar. But because it could be done all remotely and we got used to do things remotely, he was willing because, you know, he could do it from Australia. Um, and he was amazingly playful. We, we tried probably six or seven voices before we owned in on this specific one. Um, uh, yeah, we we gave him, uh, you know, a little monologue, but then we totally told him just go to town, and he made up half of the stuff. And there was so much material that we then added this little button you just saw from the same monologue. So it wasn't a scene that we had written, but we just took some pieces of all the wonderful uh, improvisations and added it and. One of our editors, I love that he came up with the idea of putting Giuseppe the fish in there so there was someone he could talk to and poor Giuseppe got dragged into the deep. <laughs> but here we go. Horrible. Um, Enrico, I, t I told you how much I love your film. Um, I love cinematically that we see everything from the point of view um, of little Luca and you know the camera, the angles, everything is set up from, we enter from his point of view. When did you decide to, to with that choice? Yeah, well, what's amazing is that you start talking camera when you're DP in, in, we, in layout. We, we have, you know, strangely in animation, we have a, a director of photography split in two persons. is a layout director mm -hmm. and a lighting director because, you know, they're two separate jobs. But together, they make our director of photography. And we started talking about a camera plan, how to support with the camera, of course, our story. I'm a big Ozu fan who always, always had this l wonderful low camera. Yeah. And we knew immediately when our, our uh, David Bianchi is our director of layout, you know, of photography. And as soon as he said, well, I think we should be really low, right? Be with the kids' point of view. And I was like, absolutely. We, this is so much about putting yourself, uh, putting the audience in the shoes of this little outsider and bringing, I, my, my hope was always to bring the adults uh, into feeling like kids again, and of course entertain them and, and really tell us something to kids too. But that was my hope to kind of bring the kid out of us a little but more the, grown up. But you also even taking it further with the director of photography, where I, when we first start watching the film, it's all wide angles, and there's a feeling of isolation in the character. And then when he meets Alberto and Julia, it all it starts getting close-ups and a connection. You know, talk to us about that, that journey. Yeah, that's another wonderful part about really thinking about a camera plan. It's like, how do you really f show progression? Um, and interestingly, very often in, in animation, your camera can do anything. It could be flying through, and, and you know you don't you don't need you don't need cranes, and you don't need anything. But for me, the important part was to limit it so that then you would feel a, a dynamic feeling. For example, in the third act, it's probably the most active because you're in the middle of a wonderful action. And you're absolutely right that we thought a lot about how to uh, also make the two worlds feel different because there's an underwater world that as beautiful as it is needs to feel a little limited. So we try to not show a whole lot of um, the land. There's a murk that kind of lets you see some beautiful silhouettes, but not much. So it, we wanted to show that that world, as beautiful as it is, it's where I grew up and, and, and swam as a kid needed to feel us too small for Luca. So we thought about how to support that with the camera. And of course, you had this sense of bringing a little uh, more uh, playfulness once Alberto comes in, and, and also feeling the difference between underwater and above water. So now, when you're above water, you see things very 
very clearly, very far, far sound. We also, it's a wonderful other sound becomes very, very sharp when we have a little more of a... And colors also, when we're underwater, is very blues and, of yeah. course, and aquamarine. And then we start getting all this warm tones when we get to the land. Yeah, that first scene when, you know, uh, literally he's a fish out of water dragged out by Alberto was something we wanted to really feel a big uh, contrast. And so colors are it, sound, it was really great to play on everything that we had. Um, and of course then, you know, nothing more warm and colorful than Cinque Terre. Once you go to that place, now there's all sorts of colors, you know, that is pretty much candy color town, so the, 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 um, the sienna, the burnt sienna, the, the reds, the, the yellows are so beautiful in that area, so that was also fun, because we knew we were gonna go all the way to that kind of color. Yeah, I and mean, there's a lot of saturation, yeah. <laughs> yes. and which I don't recall seeing an animated film that has so much saturated yeah. color. Um, you know, talk That's to right. us about that. Yeah, I think there were a couple of moments where we kept on saying more, 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 and they were like, I don't think we have any more saturation to play with uh, because we wanted to keep <laughs> even on in the shadows. It. I was noticing that yeah. there's so much color even in the darkness and the shadows. Right. Yeah, we played even with the edge of the shadows a lot. We try to develop a new technology that could, you know, at the edge of the shadow when there's a beautiful painting, we'll have like from a purple, you go to a beautiful orange. And on you'll see it on the um, on, on the stones in the town a lot. You'll see these beautiful, glowy, colorful uh, sh shadow edges. Yeah, it was something that we kept on um, wanting to feel the playfulness of the place, the beauty of the place. That was a big part of it. I always thought that again, there was something to go even further. The hardest part was in the fantasies, where we thought like, well, we already have such a, a colorful movie, but that is where I was like, we have to go even bigger. And mm -hmm. so that is where you'll see even more saturated colors, even more playful. Um, yeah, it was something that I felt strongly about bringing. It's a little bit of a 2D look too that we were after in the skies. And we, we tried a lot of things to bring warmth to the movie, which meant often we uh, would make a beautiful brush texture by hand and then bring it to the computer world. There are no once we get to Puerto Rosso, there are no straight lines. And cinematically, there's no, no straight shots. And then we have the, the ray sequence and how, you know, can you talk about the fact that there are no straight lines in your film? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that really comes from the place. If you go to uh, Cinque Terre, you'll see that the houses are all a little bit, like almost, you, you can tell they slowly, well, added to each other, so there's there is no square, there is no straight line. So we we wanted to push that even further to kind of feel the essence of the place. So everything is a little wonky, uh, uh, <laughs> and everything is a little bit uh, out of kilter. Um, I think that it, it's a very vertical place, but again, we didn't want these very straight up and down. And also, it's a land that is so between uh, mountains and sea, everything is steep. So that is a huge, wonderful part of it. So even the square, it's on a lean. You're absolutely right that even a, a proscenium on, on the beautiful houses would have a big diagonal on the, on the um, piazza. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and that, you know, um, the idea of a race felt so fun because also if you walk around the Cinque Terre, you will you will have to work hard and go up and down. And the idea that there would be a tower um, that would be the turnaround point to then have these really really steep things felt a, a wonderful gauntlet for them to have to kind of deal with, but also so typical of the place. Um, speaking of lines and shapes, I don't recall seeing a film where the characters, their design represents. Th their personality, like, um, you know, for example, Luca, I he's got this big eyes, yeah. and, 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 you know, he's, he's in this big adventure, then we meet Alberto, and he's got this big mouth, <laughs> and, and, right. and the way he walks, you know, broad-shouldered, um, and then we meet Julia, who's like a triangle, and she's got a pointy nose, and we know how independent and mm -hmm. fierce she is. You yeah. know, can you talk about that? 
Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you, you really felt those things. Yeah, I always um, feel it's important to design from the character from the inside out. So when I made my first short, La Luna, I had the same Academy Award nominated gorgeous oh, short. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I feel that that I, I kind of recast that kid a little bit in Luca's point of, you know, of course we redesigned them, but they, they had a similarity in the way they saw the world. They were all about taking in the world and curiosity. So the way I, I drew Luca would always be this kind of light bulb, big eyes, big face, taking in because it's so much a part of his character. And you're absolutely right. When we started talking about Alberto, it's like, well, he's a big talker. So what best way to have a big mouth? Um, and of course, the swagger and the bravado. Um, Broad shoulders. Yeah, and he would be a little stronger. We always thought like, well, he's, he's um, you know, so much of body language, right? I, I was Luca and my, my best friend name is truly Alberto, so he was very happy I left his name in there. Um, I was shy, and also you want to feel it in the body, so we, we kind of hunched him over a little bit. He's timid, um, especially at the beginning of the movie. So it's really not only designed with the character in mind and then with the animators going find the postures and the beautiful um, way to really feel the character even when they're not even speaking, right? So much of our media is visual. I come from a place where actually, you know, if anything, dialogue was in, was something I had to learn from, you know, La Luna was all gibberish, was like, you know, we, we just made up a language. So it was really interesting to, to, I always felt like whenever we can do something without words, let's do it and, and give a little bit of space between the dialogue, you know. Of course, we have Alberto who's gonna fill in that, 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 uh, that space, but yeah, it, and I think you're absolutely right about Julia too. We wanted something a little sharp about her. We wanted something um, wonderfully herself. She, she's gonna kind of teach Luca how to just be unapologetically herself, you know, and she has, of course, her own insecurities. Um, they're, they're all lonely kids. We wanted to also portray three lonely kids that meet each other. Um, I adore, I, would, I, I just love her. And, <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about the, the pants, this <laughs> overgrown <laughs> pants that I'm assuming they were her dad's. And, right. and how, how did that come about, this big pants that she's uh, hauling around? Yeah, I'm glad you felt that. Yeah, we, I felt it was important to bring a certain blue collar um, a nature to these little towns in, in this era, you know, we terra, La Terra Trema um, by Luchino Visconti, something I wanted to show the, the, the our, um, uh, uh, you know, our people, and we got a lot of real great inspiration because those were real uh, fishermen that were kind of cast as, um, uh, uh, you know, as actors, and just the way they were that everything was broken down and patched. It was such a, a part of making things f really lived in. Um, so the idea that she would have something that she would have adjusted from dad came up and we totally chased it. It was actually t technically quite hard in animation because she has little, you know, little legs and so these actually very wide pants, we love the shape of it, this triangular shape, there's a beautiful little um, kind of strength to it, um, but it was actually a lot of work technically because we had to kind of inflate them, uh, you know, uh, not naturally because of course she doesn't have enough uh, knees <laughs> to, to fill them in, but they were so fun to to make, make a part of her character and I think there's something, you know, it was really leaning into something iconic, like an iconic fisherman-like, um, you know, and a little bit, maybe even a little bit tomboyish mm -hmm. that, that I loved about her clothing. Um, you obviously love 1950s, 60s Italian cinema. I, I adore it. I told you that Fellini is my, my favorite director in Eight and a Half. I, you know, can you tell us about the, creating this world that is very much influenced by 50s and 60s cinema art and lifestyle, but also creating a timelessness about it. Um, yeah, I'm glad you also felt the timelessness because I, I think that's what I love that happens when you choose something like the 50s. 
it can feel a little bit out of time, even though it's a specific date, idiosyncratically, it, you feel it's a little bit out of time. Uh, that is something we were after. The reason why I thought we could really own in on the 50s and 60s, first, just the golden era of Italian cinema, cinema and, uh, music, and, and the music was just stunning. Um, you know, one of the movies I, I remember kind of pitching this idea very early. It was like, well, it's kind of like Stand By Me, but in Italy. Uh, and, and of course, Stand By Me it had this, the kind of genre of movies that where the music, it's summer, and the music is, is so present. It's a, it's a score, right? We grow up with the summer hits. And in Italy especially, I remember so much the radio, right? So I felt that bringing those wonderful old hits would be such a wonderful thing, which I haven't seen so much, especially in an animated movie. So between the cinema, the, um, the music, and the design of the era, like if you look at Vespas, honestly, you look at the 50s or Cinquecento, an old 500, Fiat 500, you will want something around that era. They're the most beautiful lines that you can think of design-wise. So, a little nostalgic. I didn't grow up in the era. Actually, I grew up in the 80s, and I always joke like, "Well, I don't, I don't know if it, you know, it would have been so interesting to go to, you know, the especially the music of the 80s. I probably, uh, admittedly, I could pass on, you know, but um, it was certainly trying to find something that um, also made more sense story-wise because you believe there might be some hidden culture when there's no scuba diving yet or something like that. So it, yeah. it kind of tied into a lot of different things. You bring up Vespa, and there's so many symbols that you use in your film so powerfully, and the Vespa, to me, I, I mean, I get emotional thinking about it. It, 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 it like freedom and, and friendship and, and youth. It's like every time I see the Vespa in your film, <laughs> it has some sort of symbolic meaning to it. You know, can you talk about the use yeah. of it was an interesting challenge because we wanted to make sure that it felt um, silly and kid-like, but real. And I think we wanted to find a balance uh, where something that, that could be like, what, what do you want to do? What is, your, what is your goal to, to what? Drive into the sunset? I, I, I like to make something that sounded stupid because they're kids, but also a symbol, then we, it was all about making sure that it felt like this is the symbol of their friendship. This is how you can be together with your friend. This is how you can have freedom, the wind in your uh, hair. So I think it was both those two things put together really made me want to lean into that, even though, you know, this was never, we wanted to be careful. This should not be an ad for a Vespa. It's just <laughs> that, it's just that I'm sure Vespa has a mind, but, um, but uh, actually, I was worried that they might not say yes, because it would have been hard to make it about lambrettas, which are not as popular. But, um, but it was a symbol. It really, you're absolutely. So it was really about, hey, it's, it's made for two, and this is the way we could be together. Is it a bit of a harebrained plan? Yes, and that's what, a bit what I liked about it. We had to kind of fight for it a little bit, because you, you know, at Pixar, we, were, we put up the movie, we share it together with other directors. You get a lot of notes, and that's actually what what is great there. You get a lot of help, but sometimes you get the like, but uh, you know, is that uh, you know um, too small, too big of a goal? And we tried hard to keep the movie in the kids' space and the kid world, and keeping it intimate and keeping their relationship at the heart of it. So it, it is in the movie with the highest stakes. Um, of course, you know, there's danger involved, which we, we always had. But um, I like how a bit silly it is. But of course, so I'm glad it feels that way because it's really meant to make you feel like this is the only way these kids could be together. And this is their symbol and of their friendship. And cinematically, we have, you know, remembrances of Roman Holiday and Audrey I, Hepburn and it Gregory is a Peck. The important thing for me was also like that they would love a really beat up one, which we had, <laughs> which we had to get past uh, uh, Vespa. I, I I remember sending them a storyboard and I kind of made it a little nicer than what we were gonna make because <laughs> I was a little worried that the rusty beat up Vespa uh, was they were weren't gonna like it. But I, I think quite well they love it so much that even beat up is okay. You know? um, yeah. Speaking of um, symbols. The sea monsters. When did you arrive at the the idea yeah. of a sea monster? Actually, quite early. You know, when we're in development on a project, 
the Pixar, you, you kind of sequester yourself and start thinking about ideas. And for me, when you think of an idea from, from day one, you want two elements. One is why is this going to be fantastical and strange and interesting and, um, and you know, worthy of animation. And two, what is it that you want to talk about that is personal to you, that you feel passionate about? You have to drive these movies for five years. You need to feel pretty strongly about what you're going to talk about and, and bring you know, 400 people to, to uh, you know, bring it to fruition. And so it was like my best friend and I, and, and the story of our friendship was at the core of it. And then the, the fantastical side that I was you know, bringing into was always these old maps. And, and there's these, you know, at the edges of the known world, there'd be these strange monsters. And I just love how, you know, when, we, when science ends, fantasy starts and imagination starts. And when I started thinking about a story about a kid that could be a sea monster at a, at a kind of a, a age of growing up, it sparked something uh, about me feeling timid, feeling a bit of an outsider. There was something about, oh, there's something about uh, puberty. And when you're growing up, that is, you feel you have something to hide. There's something you're, you're ashamed of, something that you're, you're changing every day. Who am I? So the idea that you could have a kid that could look human but wasn't and had this whole kind of werewolf-like kind of other uh, true side of himself felt really true of the, of the um, of that period of life, that there would be something that you uh, have to ultimately embrace and really show yourself. And being a very kid, a shy kid that felt, you know, we were very nerdy kids. I felt a bit like looking at the popular kids from afar. So that's what really made it, you know, a bit of an interesting, well, the beautiful designs of these old maps and, and putting it together with the possibility of like, oh, it kind of seems to speak about this, a uh, moment in life when you really are struggling with growing up. Mm, which actually nicely segues to my next question. Um, his transformations don't seem to be where he puts on something and transforms. The, the transformation seems to be happening from the inside, and like emotionally, and then he morphs into a, a human being. You know, can you talk about that approach? You look so like shocked, but I'm bringing yeah. it up. No, 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 it's absolutely, absolutely right. No, um, the transformation was a lot of trouble because it was really technically difficult. Um, but the reason why it was difficult is because we knew we wanted to represent it in different emotional ways. So that in a moment it would feel very wondrous and slow and we could observe it. And, and and linger in the in, in the you know the curiosity of it and think like I, I can't believe my body can do this, um, and then other times it would be shocking and quick and so that actually just proved to be very difficult. We needed to give all the controls to the animators to time it correctly. So it took us a year to get you know this transformation right, which was difficult. But the feeling of it, yeah, it, 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 was, uh, it was an interesting, I think that emotional you're talk, emotion you're talking about is that I wanted for him to, again, bring the Luca-ness to it, which is like, this is amazing. Uh, now, the idea that they can do this is bizarre, and we never explain it. I always chalked it up to a sense of like, well, we learned somehow half magically, half ev evolution to kind of hide in plain sight. And this is a way where we can be on a rock and that uh, we, we're not gonna be killed. Um, but it always felt important to me that ultimately, for example, when he goes out into the world at the end, he needed to be in the sea monster form because that, that is what was really true, uh, uh, truly underneath them. Now they have learned to look this other way but um, I always, interestingly, when we had that ending with him going as a human, it, it started feeling wrong because it felt like, wait, are you going to lose something of yourself? Are you going to, it almost felt like he was going to assimilate, which uh, as a metaphor, which was, all, of course, all wrong in my mind. He's going out there and he's going to change the world and slowly one person at a time and, mm -hmm. um, in some way. And of course, probably not change others. And that was an important part that we, we realized we had to say, like, well, there are people that will never accept him. But that was an interesting part of, of that side of, you know, they have this ability, but the true uh, acceptance comes from being a sea monster among, you know, being, showing 
your difference among the humans. Mm -hmm. and, and I also love the, the aspect of it, of him um, wanting to be something outside of his family, right. the need to, to find himself oh. outside of the... Yeah. Yeah, that's you know that's certainly something I I it comes a bit from me wanting feeling like my destiny was elsewhere. You know, I grew up in Genova till I was in my mid twenties. I was going to engineering school. I was I was trying. I, that's what I thought I sh I should do. That's how you make a living. And but I was kind of miserable, and I was drawing on the side of my books instead of studying them. <laughs> And um, after a couple of years, you know, I, I had, you know, I remember talking to my parents and really have to own up to like, I don't, my heart is not in this. And they were supportive. I, and, and we did want to talk certainly about that kind of curiosity that takes you in on this, on this trajectory that, that is sad because there's, the, and that is really the, the, the ending of the movie it really is about the bittersweet moment of having to say goodbye which is really overlap with the hope and excitement for the future. Uh, I felt that, you know, if you, I don't know, it probably happens to immigrants, but it happens to anyone who goes from the country to the city, or like, I feel like probably, hopefully that's something that resonates for everybody because it's such a, it's a very specific feeling. And I, I love the bittersweetness of it. And when we found that ending, I knew we had something because it kind of made us kind of cry the yeah. first couple of times we storyboarded that. and. It deepened what we were talking about friendship too, because not only we were saying, aren't those friendships amazing? They help us grow up. But isn't it sad that we have to leave them behind sometimes and bring them in our heart as we go out into the world and bring them in the way we grew together? And I, I think the big question of the movie for me was like, would I even be here if I hadn't met my brave, crazy friend? <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. would have I had the courage to take off and, and go? The film has this beautiful painter, you alluded to it, this sort of painter-like quality to it. There's also imperfections throughout it. Um, you know, the scales seem to be regular. And I'm, the fact that I'm like focusing when I was watching the film and noticing that the, his scales are irregular. Right. And, and you know, can you talk about imperfection, adding imperfections yeah. to a film, yeah. animated film? Yeah, I, I I feel the computer. You're fighting a bit. The computer, uh, uh, these softwares have been built to make huge, you know, effects live action movies, and so they actually are simulating reality very easily. Mm -hmm. So photorealism is kind of where the computer wants to go, or or it gives it to you relatively pretty cheaply because now they've gotten so sophisticated. So for me that is a little bit what we were fighting. We were asking ourselves, how do we bring warmth? How do we bring imperfection? So it was a lot about, well, we did that on La Luna 2. We would make a pastel for the galaxy and put it in the background. And so that would be handmade. There's just something, one of our enemies, well, if there was a smooth gradient, it was like, that's not, not okay. That should not be a, a smooth gradient. You know what I mean? Like we wanted, we wanted imperfections. We wanted, I think it brings a certain amount of warmth. I think it brings the fact that this is playful, but also made uh, by artists. And, and, and it was so important for me to, to keep that, uh, as we looked at the movie, we were looking at all, how many ways we can find to break a little bit the mold of, of um, somewhat realistic looking CG because a computer kind of, you know, will will give you this beautiful looking uh, object that can look completely real. And I think there's an ex a feeling of ex an expressionistic feel that to me gets closer also to the world of kids. You want to feel that playfulness. So in art, we had an amazing production designer, Daniela Strijleva, um, who lived in Italy for a couple of years, so I knew from the beginning that she had to uh, production design this with me. Um, we, she always, you know, she always understood it and felt what it was to be like a 12-year-old in Italy. And we both wanted to really bring this painterly feel to to the movie, which I, I to me, again, it goes from saturation to the way we portray. Um, a wave, for example, and uh, for me, the other side of it is just finding a certain poetic um, 
simplification. Mm -hmm. Like that's we we often said like less is more. How do we make sure that it's not fifteen thousand little bubbles on a on a beautiful wave? It's actually a beautiful design, little foam. So it's actually amazing how much often we were taking some things away but then found that you needed to have a lot of more control. Actually, the computer doesn't like it for you to do, oh, I want a splash that is beautifully designed. <laughs> the computer wants to give you 3,000 little droplets. So we were really working hard to try and little break some of this realism. And there is uh, there's a Japanese animation influence in the film, you know, the woodcuts, et cetera. Can you talk about yeah. uh, that? that impregnating your, yeah. your film. Yeah, that comes kind of from my love. I, I grew up in Italy where somehow in this 80s and 70s, there was, you know, Japanese cartoon all the time on, on TV. And, and I saw the early work of Miyazaki, you know, with all these amazing... Spirited Away. Spirited Away, Totoro. Um, and I, I was watching this old cartoon of his, this is a TV series, so it was him kind of starting to find his voice. It was called Future Boy Conan, yeah. and um, I absolutely remember loving it and finding about, you know, years later, seeing some of his movies and realizing, oh, there was something special about this cartoon that I used to watch. So I've been a huge fan for many years. I've, I've shown him La Luna. I sat in, in, the, in this little theater at, at Studio Ghibli, showing him La Luna, sweating buckets, right next to him and he, he congratulated him, he was very sweet. So there's a little connection between Pixar and Miyazaki, they've, they've done sometimes the dubs for his movies, so I remember getting the job at Pixar and thinking like, oh, maybe I'm gonna meet Miyazaki, <laughs> you know, that was one of the good reasons to go to Pixar. And so I, I, I love his movies and I've studied them and, and loved them for so long. And, and again, there's something about looking at nature with these beautiful eyes of a kid, the eyes of wonder, that I wanted to, um, of course, even within the story, really have this fish out of water that could take all these beautiful details in. And um, it, it kind of becomes this thing where like, you know, sometimes I have to watch out to not go too close to some of this stuff because it, it's just part of my DNA. It's a bit what I love, you know. But bringing a little bit of that I think brings also this 2D feel, which um, brings that warmth. So it was together with that. Um, and the animation style, it's another thing that we really had a lot of fun. The animators were a little more playful than usual. We held poses, we looked at 2D animation, we looked at stop motion, you know, Ardman's beautiful movies were an inspiration for some of the mouth shapes. Um, and we, we try to, be a little snappier and more playful with the animation. We did some multi-limbs. We call multi-limbs when you see, you know, a blurry, there, there's a moment where Alberto has five legs instead of one, which is kind of taking actually from Warner Brothers, old cartoons. Um, so we were really trying to bring 2D playfulness and warmth and in, in all these different levels. Luca has this beautiful dream sequences that are, uh, you know, reminding me of Fellini films. You know, can you talk about that? Yeah, I'm glad that you saw that connection, right? Um, that, 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 you know, I always, when you say that, I always see a foot and a rope on the <laughs> beach. <laughs> in the <laughs> kite. In the kite, yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah, there was something, um, uh, interestingly, doing an introvert, protagonists can be difficult. And to be completely honest, sometimes in the beginning, people were a little bit like, I don't know, maybe you need to talk a little more. <laughs> you know, because it's hard to get into the shoes of someone introverted. And I think, you know, some actually books have done that wonderfully. I think films sometimes a little, little harder. And I think it was one of the key things to go into his head so that we could kind of feel what he wanted. And also, it's also someone who's self-limiting. So he's saying, no, 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 I can't do this, especially in the first part of the movie. And I think for, for w when we were working on it early on, it was frustrating people. It was like, what? I don't understand him. I'm not behind him. And so there were key things that made us lean into Luca. And yes, he can be, you know, holding back. I shouldn't be doing this. But he, we wanted, it, seeing inside his head became this really helpful thing because, first of all, we could be, dreamlike and of course bring all these wonderful um, influences and Fellini, you're absolutely right. We talked a lot about Fellini because also we were gonna sprinkle it and a lot like Fellini does. There's always a little bit of the, the oniric moments. 
and um, and also show his growth. These these things, these little moments get bigger and bigger, and, and their op his world is opening. So it was, and they're really informed by what the world is giving him. The first time he's wondering what's up there, and but he he can't hold. You know how how can you show that he wants to? If he did it, he wouldn't be self-limiting. So we're like, well, actually, the good way is to show that he would would imagine it, but he can't do it. And and I love that he, for example, then takes whatever Alberto's crazy ideas of stars are, we call them star chovies for, for, for the insiders, um, and he imagines them. And, and so he's taking in wrong information, but it's actually really wonderful. I mean, in fact, we realized we needed to make sure that Julia's dream, right, and now she's opening his world even wider, we needed to make sure that that dream was fantastical enough because it was hard to beat glowy fish and a huge <laughs> fish um, moon, you know, anchovy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I love how it, it, it shows us what's in his head. It shows us he's very creative, imaginative, uh, and it gave us this license to take you to a La Luna-like place, right? This was always the question number one I had when I was, I, how do I make a feature that contains some of that fantasy? Because you can't do fantasy for you know, an hour and 40 minutes, it's, it's like gonna be, everything's gonna be the same. So you wanna find contrast. And that was kind of one of the key things, trying to get into the fantasy world. And we talked about this outside, but you slide in a beautiful uh, moment with Marcello Mastriani and his photograph, you know, and, you know, tell, tell the audience how you got permission to show a photo of Marcello Mastriani. That's right. So um, that, that wonderful photo is from Divorzio um, all'Italiana, like the Div Divorce Italian style, where he's, he's so funny. Um, and we, you know, we found, the, the story artist kind of found that photo, and it was just, we, we, we struggled to even find the right poster. It was from a, from a very obscure poster. But we had to ask permission, of course, and we ended up to Chiara Mastriani, who is this, I don't know if you know her, but she's in, she lives in France. She's Catherine Deneuve, and Marcello Mastriani's daughter. And she's had an amazing career in France. And they gave us the okay, which I was so happy because I was gonna, you know, I so wanted that little homage to be there. Um, and I was so happy. And then months later, they tell me actually that she was cast in the French version of the movie as Daniela, the mom. So and they were like, do you want to meet her? And I was like, yes. And, and, you know, it was so amazing to talk to her on Zoom for, for an hour or so. And I was just... Um, hearing stories about her dad and how, you know, how much she, she has these beautiful, beautiful memories of being on set in the summers. For her, summer was connected to being on a set with her dad and how much she loved being on a set and how much she thrived, how much she always thought about the food he was gonna order that night at the Trattoria, that's what she remembers, like, that's, oh, tonight I'm gonna order the, this and that, that dish. Um, and, you know, so a complicated, character but so much in love and and thriving in, in, on a set um mm -hmm. and so yeah it was really and she loved the movie and it was one of the first because we the movie hadn't come out yet it was one of the first people that told me how much she loved the movie and so i was so happy to hear about it and she felt like it's like a little humanistic a little more you know it's like it's like very intimate and i was like so happy that she felt that way um which leads me i'm glad you brought that um, you, you are, you know, we're used to Disney animated films and Pixar, but this film, it's such a personal story and you're breaking new ground with, with this story. Um, it, was that something that was challenging to sell it to Pixar, the fact that I'm gonna tell a very personal story? I think, um it wasn't, in theory, challenging at the beginning. So they, they loved that this was coming from, from you know, the heart. I think we always look for, for, for that important kind of feeling that, that I think it always gives you a little more of a compass in the middle of the storms you're ahead because you're going to have a sense of what's important. But as you're making it, it's still not an easy movie. A slightly smaller movie 
it's it's actually a little trickier because you, you know you have to play with more subtle um, stakes or more subtle goals. And so while making, you're a little buffeted, and you have to kind of say, well, no, 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 no. Remember, guys, like this is where, for example, that ending. When I f when we found that ending, I had to fight for it a little bit because it was the ending was all about the two of them and was all about you know Alberto and Luca. So it was just making sure that we cleared a bit the way trusted that staying smaller was the right thing because it was about a, their relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think people were really behind it, uh, uh, other than maybe, you know, sometimes instinctively you look for, what's the easiest, easiest fix here? Maybe you should do this or maybe you should do that. And you had to kind of lean in. We had some, some great support from some of our executive producers that sometimes had to say like, no, no, don't change that. Or we have a whole scene about swimming, for example, I, th that we call it the swim scene when they head out from the island to Puerto Rosso. And uh, we always joked before we even boarded that scene, we were arguing that in, in Pixar, sometimes you, you don't get scenes that are just joyful. And that scene is really just joyful. You can go, you, they're just going from point A to point B. You have no idea how many notes we got. Like, do you need that scene? Um, I'm like, no, I don't. But I feel it's encapsulating the movie. There's this wonderful little progression of Luca learning something from Alberto. So, and let's be joyful. Let's. That is the. If I was a kid, I. That is the scene I want to be in. I want to feel like a dolphin. I want to feel like I'm transforming bows. Doesn't even make sense. They shouldn't be transforming into things like that because it'd be dangerous. But we leaned into the. Let's just enjoy the moment for a, for a bit. And those were things we had to fight a little bit for because, yeah, you get a little bit like, well, do you, you know, how long does it need to be? And, you know, my editor and I would always, there's a wonderful collaboration. And she's like, you need it. We could cut it. We could cut it shorter. And, and uh, she told me, I think recently, I'm so glad you, we didn't cut that scene, you know? So I think, um, I think, there was definitely a sense of like, yeah, this is wonderful, stay with the kids story. And then as you go along the road, you kind of be a little bit um, watchful and have the right allies because you will get notes that are a little more like, well, maybe the stakes need to be bigger or, you know, or things like that. Yeah, well, I could go on talking to you, Enrico, but we can actually um, just segue over to the reception and we can continue chatting. Yeah, um, thank you. But thank you so much for being here. That's what an pleasure. incredible yeah, film. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you were able to see it in the theater, too, because that was the one thing that we didn't get a whole lot of people to, to watch it the way you just did. You know, that was... Of yeah. course, we always work on them on the big screen. So, but um, we'll see you at the reception game. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.